The Bible Treasury, New Series. N7. A monthly magazine of papers on scriptural subjects. Volume 27, Article 34, 1908 and 1909. Part 34 of 46. Studies in the Gospel of Mark. By W. J. Hawking. 34. Seeking a short seclusion. And the apostles gather themselves together unto Jesus and they told him all things whatsoever they had done and whatsoever they had taught. And he saith unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desert place apart. And the people saw them going, and many knew them, and they ran there together on foot from all the cities. And he came forth and saw a great multitude, and he had compassion on them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things, Mark 6 verses 30-34, Revised Version. The execution of John the Forerunner constituted an epoch in the ministry of the Blessed Lord. It showed that Israel would not receive divine testimony. From this point onwards he instructed his disciples plainly concerning his own sufferings and death which would follow at Jerusalem. In the appointed order of God John was constituted the pioneer of the faithful and true witness, bearing testimony to him in a remarkable manner from his earliest history. Was it not through the son whom she had not seen that Elizabeth was first able to hail Mary as the mother of her Lord? Luke 1 verses 41-45 that light of witness which shone so feebly at the outset rose to the zenith of its full brilliance when John's clarion call rang out for all who had ears to hear, Behold the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world. From that moment the lamp of prophecy waned, for John was soon delivered up to prison, and Jesus himself came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, Mark 1 verse 14. And the preaching of Jesus continued up to the period to which we have arrived, some two years later. During this lengthy period, for him, John had languished in confinement, waiting for the day to break and the shadows to flee away. The voice of the Messiah was heard in the land, throughout Judea and Galilee. When he himself had cried in the wilderness, multitudes had flocked to his preaching and to his baptism. Now one was speaking whose shulachet he was not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Yet week after week, Sabbath after Sabbath, new moon, and Passover went by, and the kingdom was not restored to Israel. As we consider John's long and dreary imprisonment, can we chide him as an impatient man because he sent disciples to Jesus, asking, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? The Master did not upbraid him nor may we. The truth was that the lofty ideals of Messiah's glorious kingdom were not to be realized in a human fashion, and since signs of immediate deliverance from the oppressor were wanting, many of the sons of Israel would on that account stumble at the stone Jehovah was setting in Zion. The humble guise of the Messiah caused the thoughts of many hearts to be revealed, and the Baptists among others. Nevertheless, the Lord said to the disciples of John, Blessed is he whosoever shall find none occasion of stumbling in me, Matthew 11 verse 6. It would seem that God in his inscrutable wisdom delayed the final removal of John from the earth until Messiah had delivered an adequate testimony to the people of Israel and that testimony was seen to be unheeded and rejected. The martyrdom of John was in effect a public act, signifying that Israel was not ready to receive the one of whom John spake, Mark 9 verses 12 and 13, just as the martyrdom of Stephen was the public act which proclaimed that the nation would not accept the crucified Messiah whom God had glorified and whom Stephen was preaching. The coincidence of the testimonies of John and Jesus and the personal love Jesus had for the Baptist are special features of Matthew's Gospel more than Mark. It is there noted how the news of his death affected him. Accomplishing in lowly service, however personally exalted above him, together with John, the testimony of God in the congregation, he felt himself united in heart and in his work to him, for faithfulness in the midst of all evil binds hearts very closely together, and Jesus had condescended to take a place in which faithfulness was concerned, see Psalm 40 verses 9 and 10. On hearing therefore of John's death he retired into a desert place. The kingdom which John proclaimed was not then to be set up in power, and he was therefore taken away, 
for the time of his public reward as a righteous prophet was deferred until the Son of Man should come in his glory, and the people should say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Thus the powers in authority wrought their evil will upon the Baptist, as they would shortly do upon Jesus. This the Lord knew, though his apostles did not. Hence we find that about this period the Lord began to withdraw himself more from the populace and to devote himself to the instruction of the apostolic band in regard to the sufferings and death that awaited him at Jerusalem. It was needful for them to know the mysteries of his person and work, and thus in measure to be equipped to become able ministers of the new covenant in the particular form in which it was soon to be introduced. A summary showing the connection referred to may be helpful. Comparing the first three Gospels, it will be observed that following immediately upon the account of the death of John the Baptist we have a record of the events named below. 1. Jesus taking his disciples apart, Matthew 12, Mark 6, Luke 9. 2. Jesus feeding the crowds who sought him out, but leaving the apostles to cross the lake alone, though he eventually came to their deliverance in the storm, Matthew 14 and 15, Mark 6 and 7, Luke 9. 3. Jesus inquiring what men said of him, and eliciting personal confession from the apostles, Matthew 16, Mark 8, Luke 9. 4. Jesus speaking precisely of his sufferings and death at Jerusalem, and of the cross of discipleship. While the general order of the sequence is found in the three synoptists, the several events enumerated are brought into closest juxtaposition in the Gospel by Luke. Gathering to Jesus the apostles at the bidding of their master had gone in various directions in the service of the kingdom. That particular service being now completed they gather themselves together unto Jesus. It is not stated that they were directed to do so. In a sense, it was the natural thing to do. To assemble to him was the instinctive act of their spirits. To whom else should they go? For them, there was now but one master upon the earth, and accordingly, they spontaneously gathered themselves together to the Lord and told him all their doings and all their sayings. The act was a simple, natural, obvious one historically, but it is often forgotten that the principle of it abides true, so long as there is service to Christ in exercise upon the earth. Are there deeds to be done, and words to be said in his name in an unfriendly world? When the mission is ended let the report of the proceedings be made at headquarters, whether the necessity arises daily, weekly, or yearly, the principle underlying it is the same. The master tells his servants what to do, the servants tell their master what they have done. In a well-known promise, he himself has shown that this practice was to be continued during the time of his absence. Laying down the general principle, he said, Where two or three are gathered together unto my name, there am I in the midst, Matthew 18 verse 20 taken aside. On the one hand, we find that the apostles returned of their own accord to Jesus at Capernaum after their tour of service, on the other hand we find that the Lord upon their return took them aside for a season of privacy. This was the Lord's own arrangement for their well-being as his servants. An eastern house is open to anyone who will enter, and mealtimes form no exception to the freedom of general access which everyone expects to be allowed. Jesus said therefore to the apostles, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. They had no leisure, or rather they had no convenient opportunity to eat, on account of the incessant intrusions of the people. Leisure may be thought to imply absence of occupation, but the turn here seems to be that there was no suitable occasion even for meals, on account of persistent interruption. It is well to note that the great master, who sent out these men into active enterprise, also led them apart to rest a while. Not that their work was all finished. The harvest was as plenteous as ever, the laborers were still few. A world of need was around them. But the same voice that said on one occasion, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, for the night cometh when no man can work, John 9 verse 4 also said to the same persons, Come ye yourselves apart and rest a while. Need it to be said that he is the Lord and that he will say to us work or rest, as he in his perfect wisdom sees best. 
it is ours to respond cheerfully and readily to either of these calls or to any. Strike, thou the master, we thy keys. The anthem of the DIST in ease. In point of fact, the apostles had been passing through a perilous experience. They had been preaching their first sermons and performing their first miracles. They were therefore exposed to the deadly snare of the novice, 1 Timothy 3 verse 6. Is it extravagant to suppose that they, like the seventy shortly afterwards, were highly elated at the outward signs of what appeared to be their brilliant success? The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in thy name, Luke 10 verse 7. But the Lord showed them how, by reason of their immature judgment, they had failed to grasp the true proportion of things. The endowments of grace far exceeded in value the equipment for service. Their names were written in heaven and not in the dust of the earth, and this enrollment for heavenly blessing was the fit subject for their rejoicing rather than their delegated power over unclean spirits. For a like reason, mayhap, the Lord said to the twelve, Come ye yourselves apart, and rest a while. The rest would sober their spirits. The Lord had many things to say to his servants, but he could not say them there where so many were coming and going. Communications that could not be made to the twelve on the seashore were made on a former occasion indoors, Matthew 13 verse 36, but when the house became overcrowded privacy must be sought elsewhere. An individual might secure this privacy by entering into his closet, and barring his door, Matthew 6 verse 6, but the circumstances were different in this case. There were a number of them, and the Lord turned aside to the solitudes of the wilderness with his little company. Instances are not wanting in scripture history which establishes the necessity for seasons of retirement in the public life of men of God. In the presence of fellow men, the manifold activities and responsibilities of mutual relationship tend to exclude the sense of the invisible and the eternal, but in privacy, faith, hope and love are quickened into exercise and strengthened for the day of conflict. It was by the river Chebar that the heavens were opened to Ezekiel the priest, and he saw visions of God. And it was while exiled in Patmos that John beheld the glorious Son of Man among the seven golden candlesticks, and saw vistas of the future depicted in the gorgeous imagery of the Apocalypse. Moses found a burning bush, not in Egypt but in Horeb, and forty years of sheep tending on the untenanted slopes of the mountain was a needful part of his training to become the leader and lawgiver of Israel. And so the Lord's call, come apart and rest a while, was no new element in the method of divine training, but the call is the more impressive, coming as it does, from the lips of the assiduous servant of God whom Mark portrays. Let it be the more carefully to be remembered that it is in seclusion that the deep-lying principles of divine life are deepened, strengthened, and developed for days of activity. Apart from these seasons of silent and secret growth, such fruit as may appear is likely to be unripe and untimely. Shepherdless Sheep The Lord accordingly went away with his apostles in the boat, which, apparently, was one allotted to their use, compare Mark 3 verse 9, Mark 6 verses 45 and 51. Their destination was an uninhabited district on the shores of the Sea of Galilee where the required privacy might very well be found. It was, as Luke tells us, near the town of Bethsaida, Luke 9 verse 10. This was not the Bethsaida near Chorazin upon which the Lord's woes were pronounced, Matthew 11 verse 21, but is generally believed to be a town some miles to the eastward known as Bethsaida Julius. They did not depart unnoticed. The people were too much alert. They had received many benefits through the mercy of the Master, and some seemed to have kept watch upon his movements. The embarkation of the little band was observed, and many knew him. They recognized the benefactor, and with characteristic impetuosity, and with some labor and fatigue, they followed on land for some ten or twelve miles the progress of the boat, being joined by many others from the neighboring villages. Mark, with his customary graphic detail, records that the people ran, such was their earnestness, and, moreover, that they ran afoot. And Jesus coming forth either from the boat on landing, or from the place of retirement having arrived first, saw this great multitude and was filled with compassion. He knew their case, 
marked their eager and laborious pursuit of him, appreciated their mute but eloquent prayer that he would do them some good, and as a consequence, he was filled with compassion. What a heart of infinite capacity his was to be filled! How great the volume of pity when he was filled! The multitude was a great one, but the Lord knew the burden and the need of each person present. God's love was there below, and there is no creature, great or small, beyond his pity which embraced all, nor any ocean rolls so vast that he forgets one wave of all that restless sea. But this occasion, however, was more than an illustration of his universal love. It exemplified his particular concern. In his general providence, the Heavenly Father feeds the birds of the air, Matthew 6 verse 26. But this company was of more value in his eyes than they. They were not like the busily curious idlers in Capernaum from whose incessant coming and going the Lord had turned away. These persons had been seeking him with some pains and inconvenience to themselves. They had traveled some miles to reach him. They were now before him, faint in body and weary in spirit. Had they not been as sheep going astray? Were they not now returning to the shepherd and bishop of their souls? And he was filled with compassion for them. Who was there in all the earth to care for these poor ones of the flock of Israel? A Gentile emperor at Rome ruled them with a rod of iron. An Edomite sat on the throne of David. Were Annas and Caiaphas high priests such as the people needed, men who would bear gently with the ignorant and with them that were out of the way, Hebrews 5 verse 2. There was no compassion in the hearts of the scribes and Pharisees who devoured widows' houses and loaded men's shoulders with heavy burdens grievous to be borne. The grave had but just closed upon the mutilated corpse of the last of the line of the prophets of God. Truly Israel was without prophet, priest, or king. The people were as sheep not having a shepherd, Numbers 27 verse 17, 1 Kings 22 verse 17, Ezekiel 34 verses 5 and 6. All this the Lord saw very fully, and he was filled with compassion for them. Their own shepherds did not pity them, Zechariah 11 verse 5, for they were but hirelings, and did not own the sheep, who were therefore afflicted because there was in point of fact no shepherd, Zechariah 10 verse 2. We may ask ourselves who was it there by the Galilean Sea with these compassionate thoughts for Israel? Was not this Jehovah echoing what he spake of old through the prophet Isaiah? He was saying, Surely, these are my people, I will be their Savior. He had come down to be afflicted in their affliction, to redeem them in his love and pity, to hear them and carry them as in the days of old, Isaiah 63 verses 8 and 9. His arm was not shortened that it could not save, his ear was not heavy that it could not hear. The Lord's heart of pent-up goodness needed but to find a channel, and it found a suitable channel in this indigent friendless people, so he began to teach them many things. They were to him the poor of the flock, and he began accordingly to feed them. He was himself their living food, come down from heaven. As he said, He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Blessed Master, how lovely to have thy character to rest on, to study, to feed on. Oh, may we feed so richly on it, that when we meet thee, thou mayest be to us a known Jesus, and the sympathies of thy spirit may be with what thy spirit has already matured in our hearts, and seeing thee in glory as thou art, all the inward springs and depths of thy character may then be revealed to us.